we look at development to our lifestyle and in that process somewhere we come out of nature and go on a different path now this is what i am going to uh, address today in my talk so let's let's begin this is a very simple uh, you know emblem that i liked when i was uh, going through some of the research material this is uh, an emblem of the country resource conservation and development council of kutcha state in usa it's a beautiful depiction of how resource conservation and development has to go hand in hand if the human being and even if this planet has to be sustained now i agree there is a mammoth pressure on our planet mainly because we have a limited land and on this land we are increasing in number our own population is supposed to surpass that of china by 2027 and we would be adding about 273 million number in just next three decades we are not increasing our land and if you see the land use that we have in india you will find almost 50% of our land resource is used for agriculture and the remaining is of course so the forest is only 20% what is it i am deliberately putting in front of you some old uh, data which is of 1960 and you can see the amount of forest cover which we had 1960 is in this generation of we uh, you and maybe your grandparents so within this short span what see what we have lost one is look at bombay from 5000 square kilometers we are back to 140 square kilometers at jaipur from 1500 it has gone to 59 bangalore from almost 4000 we have come to around 300 now what are we doing with our forests we are just expanding and expanding because we need space we need urbanization are we really not doing a great neglect to natural resources natural resources if you look at the world over india is the leading country to be using the maximum land for agriculture almost more than 50 to 60% of the land is used for crops but if you see countries like brazil and sweden they have such very high percentage of forest cover whereas india is around 20% of course with satellite image we claim that we are 22% but i would still love to keep it as 20% because it's not a substantial increase as far as ecological Uh, balance and natural resource conservation is concerned so this planet earth if you look at we already know that 70% of this planet earth is ocean so we are living in that 30% of that space that is available on this planet if you look at that 30% space 10% is gone in ice caps glaciers and so on 20% is very barren and we just have around 70 71% of land that we can live on and if you see that land also 50% of that we are using for agriculture 37% is forest 11% is scrub land 1% is is what we live in that's the urban land the built up area and so on and 1% is fresh water now the funny thing is in this 50% of that agricultural land that we are using 70 more than 75% is used for livestock that means dairy poultry and those kind of things and just 23% is used for plant crops and the unfortunate thing more about is that out of this 70 75% of land that we use for livestock it provides only 37% of the protein need of the world but 63% of it is given by us now the question is are we really supporting life on planet earth the right way now people may argue then should we leave uh, non vegetarian food that's not the question the point we i need to uh, push today is the kind of resource utilization that we use on this planet today for so called development and food security is so lopsided we need to think about it if we if we can't do anything about it fine but at least we aware that such it's a lopsided energy utilization is what is sustaining our life today 
day on this planet. Forest cover changes. All uh, if you see in our own state, you will find that there is absolutely reduction in the forest cover in, in last three to four five years, and it is not a, a, a big sign. Now, even if there is a reduction of one percent to two percent of forest, it is a huge amount of land that we are losing every year. in way of urbanization agriculture like we know this is happening we need to be aware of these things now if you look at the industries that are using the land you will find the maximum forest land is used by mining and we just cannot be living without mining we need metal we need minerals we need to sustain our industries so mining has to continue but today even there are lot of uh, advanced countries who use some different technology for mining which reduces the impact on our resources if you do that technology our minerals are going to be expensive so then the question is are we ready to pay more for getting those minerals to our daily use my suggestion is and my opinion is we should be ready to pay more because that's saving our nature urban air situation all over the city i don't want to explain it's a huge problem and i just want you all to come to this point is the total suspended particles that is there in the land and that comes maximum from our vehicles and you know in mumbai and delhi it's the highest suspended particles are seen now with lockdown with vehicular traffic very much less we are seeing quite a lot of change in our air Uh, the fog in the morning is less the mist in the morning is less we see much more far beyond our balcony that we could see otherwise now these are indications that how much of pollution and smog were we sustaining and tolerating for so many years and we never used to complain this is the right thing that we are doing that's a question i want you all to think look at the other aspect is production of garbage and waste in our daily life i'm taking the example of us because us is supposed to spend maximum on garbage now if you look at the uh, readings from 1960 to 2010 you will find there is a steady increase but somehow the amount of recycling that the united states has is about 35% which is not great but still they are doing they almost have about 90 95% of collection of garbage in some places it is almost 100% if you see their per capita expend, uh, you know production of garbage they produce about you know right now about 2 kilos of waste per head and of that about 720 gram is recycled on the other hand if you look at india we produce less waste just about half a kilo per head is what is our uh, production of garbage but our efficiency of recycling is very bad on top of it we have to spend about 1500 rupees per ton for recycling or disposal of the waste now are we ready to foot the bill and the unfortunate thing is many of the state governments local government bodies villages are unable to foot this bill and therefore the garbage is just dumped so today if you see in india almost more than 90% of the garbage is just dumped on land there is no treatment as such to the solid waste that is produced if you look at it again in the city wise this is a 220 i mean 2012 data which has come from the central pollution control board so it's a government data so i am vouching on it you know mumbai produces maximum tons per day and that's around 0.45 chennai produces about 6 it's very high considering the kind of uh, lifestyle they have now of this garbage that is produced in these cities you will find about 20% can be recycled and the remaining 80% can be just burned so they are all compostable so what we are doing is we are incinerating because most of it would be incinerated and that's not the right way to dispose of these waste and most importantly it has to be stopped at the production at the generation level so people have to be aware that i should not be producing so much garbage of Uh, material every day in my life so how should I, i change my lifestyle this is what i need for you all to think during my talk when i put up all these points to you if 
you look at the solid waste composition of India, now this is a, a chart which is uh, comparing the 1996 to 2015, you will find the biodegradable material in our garbage is not changing much. That means our food style has not changed. But our paper usage has increased, plastic usage has increased, metal usage has increased, glass usage has increased. Now this is going to go up. And if you see, there is only 70% collection on an average. This is on an average for India. There is 70% collection of waste. So where is the 30% going? It's not even getting collected in an organized manner. So this is again a uh, very, you know, very serious concern that we all should have. Yes, it may not be happening in my house. It may not be happening in my society, but it is happening in our own country. Now, the most important, uh, you know, problem that has arose, uh, uh, arose because of our lifestyle changes in the modern world is the information technology coming in and the generation of e-waste. Do you see the amount of e-waste that we generate? It's almost more than 10 times that we are generating, if you compare in the last, uh, you know, 15 years, today it is much more, but you, in even comparison with 2005, 2015, it is more than 10 times. So. Where are all these e-waste going? And if you look at this uh, city-wise comparison, ex just Delhi and Bombay together produce 50% of the e-waste of India. So much is the electronic electrical material that is being used by people in Mumbai and Delhi. And we account for almost 50% of that. And unfortunately, if you look at the e-waste disposal, because they require very high technology, uh, you know, processing, to remove the metals out of those electro bones and batteries and so on. That's very poor. It's hardly 10% in many of the states. Maharashtra can be boast and say we are doing 20%. But that's hardly anything. 80% of this waste is just coming up onto the land. And we are increasing our rely I mean, reliance on the electronics and our e-waste is going to increase. So what are we doing? Are we aware of this? We just change our mobiles, we just change our, uh, you know, electronic systems, our laptops, and we just don't bother what happens to our old laptop or old mobile. And this is what is happening. We're just going into that waste. Now, all this comes out because we all have this habit of NIMBY. NIMBY means not in my backyard. As long as it is not in my house, I don't have to worry. If it is happening in someone else's house, fine. I don't have to worry so much, but if it is happening in my house, my backyard, then I have to worry. But this we need to change because that's what is causing all the problems. We clean our house, throw it outside. We don't mind what happens to the river streams and the garbage dumps. We are only worried that our house should be free of garbage. Now this attitude we have to change. Then only development can become sustainable. I come to the detail of this as I progress. I'm giving you a very simple example of this attitude of not in my backyard. I'm talking about Dadar Chopati. Dadar Chopati, you all know, just across Shivaji Park, very small beach. Today or there is hardly any beach. At high tide, you don't see any beach. But what has happened to that beach? This is the beach of Dadar Chopati. Now, years back, you can even see the uh, Sea Rock Hotel. So this is at least 20 years back. I remember going to this beach to swim and enjoy. That time I remember the beach used to be so big. You can ask some of your parents or your grandparents how Dadar Chaupati was used to. Today, Dadar Chaupati is hardly there because of this Burli Bandra Singh. Now you may say that, oh, he is not very happy about development. He is not happy about this beautiful architectural monument that Bombay has got, which is equivalent to some of the best in the world. I agree. I definitely agree. I am not against the ceiling. But how the ceiling was commissioned and how it was made, given to Mumbaikers is something which we need to understand. So I will go to the detail of this because I have worked on this quite a lot because I was a petitioner against building of the Varli Bandra ceiling and my petition were we I with some about 12 of us we went on to Supreme Court and you know appealed against the building of uh, the ceiling and I'll tell you what happened 
Now, if you see the genesis of these plans, you know, government had planned of this ceiling long back. And at that time, there were lots of committees who looked into this problem. Does Mumbai need this ceiling? That was a question they tried to answer. And there were a lot of committees, 1987, Paranjpe, Kulkani Committee, Mangrove Committee, a lot of committees, World Bank reports, government department reports. None of these reports actually said yes, ceiling is required and it should be a go ahead. But still, government was adamant, they wanted a ceiling. So in 1990, and they gave the clearance. Now I'll tell you the detail of this. The ceiling was supposed to be built under the MUTP, that is the Mumbai Metropolitan Urban Transport Project, which was funded by the World Bank. A huge amount of fund they got. Now, in that World Bank report, they had made a very good survey of Mumbai city. And they found that 72% of this fund should go to railways, because railways are the life science of the city. They said 21% should go to highways, and 7% should go to buses and ferries. They said waterways should be develop more in Mumbai and please look into that matter. But nothing of this happened. Now why they said this? If you look at the roads of Mumbai, you will find that the BST buses, mainly the BST buses, take about 4% of the road space. But they carry 51% of the commuters. I am not talking about the railways. This is only the road. Taxis and rickshaws take 12% of the road area but they transport only 32% of computers. Private vehicles take 84% of the road space and they carry only 17% of the passengers or commuters. This is the truth even today with minor increase and decrease in this percent. This is the truth even today. And when we went to Supreme Court, Maharashtra government said in the Supreme Court that the ceiling is for the common man, for the common man's transport. Now you tell me how many BST buses fly on ceiling from the day it was commissioned. Can you call it a common man's transport? If you pay 140 rupees to go to one throw on that particular ceiling, I don't think it can be called as a common man's road. But the Supreme Court do away our petition saying that it is for the common man's interest that the ceiling is made fine. Now government wanted the ceiling. Now if you look at the ceiling, you need to understand why we were against the ceiling. We were not because that ceiling is not uh, architecturally viable and so on. It was basically the ecological impact that it will have. And the government had not taken enough cognizance of the ecological impact of this such developmental project, what they call. The Mahim Bay, you know, this is the Varli end and this is the Bandra end of the Mahim Bay. Mahim Bay has a very different flow of the water. You know, the sea, the tide comes in from Burley, though we see it coming straight, they are actually coming at an angle. And the water comes in in large amounts. I am talking about millions and millions of liters of water coming in. They come inside and they enter into the Mahim Creek and gets towards the DKC. And that is how all these mangroves get water and they survive. Now, I will give you a very simple example. Mahim Creek is discharged with as much sewage as possible from all of the areas in Mumbai, including Taravi. Despite so much of sewage going into Mahim Creek, the Mahim Creek is not very, very badly smelling place. Of course, there is a stench, but not so much if you consider the liters and liters of sewage that is going in. That's because there is a natural process of, you know, cleaning that is happening with those mangroves, the microorganisms, the small animals which are living there and they contribute to this cleaning process and therefore almost a clean water flows back into the sea when the low tide comes in. Now what happened with the uh, ceiling coming? I'll come to the detail of that. For the building of the ceiling, the government wanted to reclaim part of this land and this land exactly at the mouth of the creek and so the mouth of the creek got narrow. Additionally, they reclaimed some portion in the Bandra reclamation, which is the park now. Now, these were the lands that they reclaimed. This is what we were totally objecting. They said, don't narrow the mouth of the creek. 
they said no that has to be needed otherwise the ceiling uh, you know approach road cannot be built so they put up a pump here which is still not very working properly and now what has happened is with this narrowing of the mouth the flow of the sea cannot enter into the mahin creek as much as it was doing before so what happens is the water doesn't reach towards the farther end of the uh, bkc and therefore the mangrove along this portion of bkc started dying we were so upset we thought that maybe now people will start you know cutting the mangroves and start uh, reclaiming the land and you know bkc land is so prime there will be a lot of people ready to buy those land but somehow it got stopped now what has happened in the mahin bay is that because of this huge amount of water piling up here they are not entering in <coughs> the water started pushing against the walls around this side and also along this side now these people the people who are staying along this road they started facing the biggest disadvantage because the waves started lashing there monsoon was terrible for them you can ask those societies even today how do they sleep in the night in high tide i mean their windows and doors actually shatter when the high tides hit them because the water is coming up so much because otherwise most of the water is to get in here that is now reduced and everything is piling up here so fishing got lost the sewage flow got reduced so the mahin bay started becoming polluted this is unfortunate thing that happened now let's look at the sea link you know the government wanted to build the sea link which was a cable stay suspension bridge now this is the design they actually wanted it's a very beautiful design like the san francisco bridge now they had three uh, pillars one at the early one at the bandra and one in the center so you just had very clear span ahead absolutely no uh, disturbance for the water flow this was some plan which was not having much of an environmental issue now when the government started to build this they really found out that they don't have enough money to fund this uh, 1.6 km long bridge now what to do money is less and the government was losing their time because they are losing their term so the tenure was coming to end but they wanted the bridge so they decided that why not reduce the bridge so the currently the bridge that you see here is actually a smaller version of what was originally planned and that caused all the environmental issues this is what we were fighting for that we were okay with this design environmentally this was not much though transport wise it was not going to help the common man but at least ecologically it was not it was little more sound better design than this now what they did was they reduced the distance of the actual bridge to half a kilometer from 1.6 km the remaining portion they made pillars and actually drew the approach point now these pillars are the ones which are now blocking the water flow from the varli end to the mahim bay so there are about 90 pillars which was originally not there in the plan now what has happened after now once the thing was they also had this terrible map on their website the msrdc wherein they already showed that there is no mangrove here they had already taken for granted that the mangroves will die and they would be reclaiming the land so this is the kind of government department we have who so publicly openly say that they are not for ecological preservation what we got was this kind of a bridge with lots of pillars and for the name sake of suspension <coughs> we have a half a kilometer bridge which we are so proud of it today now what has happened to the water this has happened to the water the water is getting blocked now please remember though the pillars are placed one uh, away from the other at the bottom there is so wide construction and foundation that the water flow at the lower part of the water column is very much reduced so what you see on the top is okay but inside the inside as you go deeper the water is getting blocked and therefore the sediment coming into the mahim bay is not flowing out and it is all getting settled and this is one of the reason why the shivaji park died because of the ceiling so now what has happened is everything is getting uh accumulated here the walls of these embankment is so much pushed with water in high tide that today 
the government has to think about saving those areas. What we got today, we got a clover leaf, you know, uh, traffic exchange, beautiful one to see in the night. We also got a promenade, which was on the reclaimed land. But is this what ecologically sound development? My question to you. Now, what has happened to Shivaji Park? This is Shivaji Park at the beginning when the uh, you know the, the ceiling was being built. You can see the the construction is just going on. The sea rock is still there, and see the width of this. And today in low tide, you can see the sediments lying here. There's so much of sediment which is here after the ceiling has come. And at high tide, there is hardly any beach. The water comes almost to the uh, you know towards the wall that's near the Bayers Bangalore. And also at the uh, uh, Dr. Ambedkar Ji's, uh, you know, Punya Thiti, that area also gets heated with water. And what is this? That in high tide, the water just comes. In monsoon, it is a huge, uh, dangerous place to be there with water coming towards the almost wall. Now, this is a, uh, the Dr. Ambedkar's Punya Thiti entrance, and you can see the water coming right up to that. And today, government is thinking of building a wall. So, is this what we call as development? That the entire beach will be gone. We will have a marine drive promenade like starting from Varli. It will go up to Bandra. So, you can walk on that concrete, uh, you know, pathway and enjoy the sea. Is this what we want? Why should we lose our shore? Such a beautiful beach because of some wrong planning, it's cost saving and, you know, sacrificing the environmental and the ecological sustainability that should have been there. Coming to another aspect, you know, with our development, urbanization and, uh, you know, encroachment into the forest land, we have divided the forest into isolated areas. And what has happened today is animals have started coming out because we are going into their place. There are a lot of uh, areas where elephants are coming into the cultivated land and there is a lot of conflicts with humans especially in the estates, agricultural land in South India, a lot of elephants come out. Now, why is this happening? If you look at the elephant population in India, you will find they are concentrated in South, in the Northeast, and in the Eastern sector, and some in the UP, upper UP areas. Now, here, these populations of uh, elephants are today isolated. And scientists have understood that these isolated patches of, uh, you know, for, forest need to be connected. The elephants are, uh, you know, uh, very wasteful feeders. They feed at one place, go to uh, uh, that area, finish the uh, food there, trees are uprooted, and then they migrate to another. They, they have chosen this lifestyle because of their habit of eating in that fashion. So they need long stretches of undivided forest for movement. And if they don't get it, they will come into the agriculture because that is a easily available, very nutritious food. We grow crops which are very nutritious. We grow nuts which are very nutritious and they are the best ones that they get. So they will not, they will, why should they go back to the forest? So now what we are thinking is there is a national program on elephant corridor protection. The unfortunate thing is this project has not yet actually launched totally. There is crunch of money. We have lots of money to build bridges, to build roads, but we don't have money to save our forests. That's the unfortunate thing. So you can see in the northwest there are about, about uh, eight corridors identified. In the northeast about 58 corridors. East around 50 four and some 46 called. Now, what are these where the elephants are present? Get protected area which will not have any human encroachment. So the elephants can migrate from one forest to other. One very good example is in Kerala and Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. All three areas have large number of elephant population. Large in the sense, at least from the current situation, you can call it large. Now, there is a connection between the Mudumalai, Bandipur, Nagarole and the Arla uh, sanctuary. So the elephants do move accord like this, but they are unable to move along this place because there are in between patches which are absolutely, 
with human settlements, villages, and town, small towns, because of which elephants cannot move from one forest to the other. Now, what the government is planning is to remove these settlements, give them places to stay, buy those land from these people, and actually keep it as protected area. So now the elephants can actually move round like this all along with no hindrance. which will keep our natural forest also healthy and the wildlife in that also healthy the forest becomes continuous this is a, uh, the project and an elephant called meadows would do it is very very important if you need to now the question is why do you want elephants the, the very fact that elephants are there means the forest are healthy we get lot of forest and these forests that i have shown here in this slide they are the ones which are very important for our mansoon So if these forests are not there, we will not get our monsoon crop. So it's very important that these forests are maintained and they are luxuriant. The other thing is about the migratory birds. You know, we have lots of migratory birds which come from foreign countries to India and they locate in various places. Now the black stars that you see here, those are the ones which are called as a uh, Ramsar sites, and these Ramsar sites are the ones which are protected. but the birds don't understand which is protected and not protected so they go to unprotected lakes also like these rounds so we need to understand that all these places where these birds are coming these are fresh water lakes and if we protect these lakes actually we are preserving the water resource of the country so whenever we talk about protecting wildlife it is actually protecting our natural reserves natural resources in terms of water soil and everything so if we can save all this place it is a big natural benefit biodiversity benefit to the entire nation now this is there are few in fact we have to talk to even our foreign countries because if birds come from those foreign lands and even those countries has to help us because in those places don't have the conservation measures those birds won't come here so actually preserving the fly path of a migratory bird would mean that the all the forest and natural resources places that are along the flight path of these migratory birds will all be conserved can you imagine the benefit that all the people along this flight path will get that's why in many of the villages in rajasthan and jaipur they love these migratory birds coming because they know that the coming of this migratory bird means my land is rich they got food so if the land is rich and it can give food i can also survive now this is the kind of uh, you know sustenance that is needed to be developed in our lifestyle we cannot go away from nature now for all these things we need to encourage people's participation it's a very important thing because unless the people are part of it these programs will not come into a successful state now let's look at some example what do you mean by people participation one is that we need to look at the socio economic economic condition the legal aspects and solve the political issues which become a major major hurdle in many of these projects because the center says something the state says something if the center and states are talking proper the village panchayat has something else now these all these political issues need to be solved if these projects have to come in production now most important thing is that agriculture has to be sustained biodiversity has to be conserved and the local people must get their livelihood these are the three major thing that must be addressed if you want a sustainable development now we can do this by simple direct payment of the ecosystem service you are taking some ecosystem service from a place then those people living there must get the benefit so see that the local tribals and local farmers get the benefit of what resources we take away from them for our lifestyle in urban and semi urban areas so the scheme should understand now there are a lot of schemes which allow the farmers to produce organic uh, food products farm products which are more eco friendly now there are places where they are actually testing and finding out that how much chemicals are coming out in the drained water of their farm if there are no chemicals then the certification is given now such kind of certification can be given for lot of products in india which have lot of demands outside like oranges coffee cardamom uh, many of the spices honey 
has lot of demands abroad because we have some special honeys being produced in several states of India. And if you can put some mark on this, these local people will get lot of benefit because these products will give them more of money from abroad. One of the example is this elephant coffee, Ane coffee they call it. Now there is nothing to do with the elephant and the coffee. The coffee grows. The same plantation is there. Only thing is the plantation allows elephants to come feed. So they allow elephants to come. They allow some elephants to come and feed. The elephants will destroy some of the coffee plantation. They don't mind. And because the elephants are allowed to come into these coffee plantation, these coffee plantations are then called the elephant friendly coffee plantation. So the coffee produced in this are much more in demand abroad, especially in Europe, because they say, oh, this is coming from a coffee plantation which does not drive away elephants. So they are living in harmony with elephants. And they give almost three times the cost of normal coffee. Now that three times of cost coffee that is uh, obtained, excess amount go back to the same village, same people. They are becoming rich, they are finding it. So living in harmony with elephants, they are benefiting better. So there are such various uh, ex examples where we can have landscape labels on Indian products and make sustainable development much a better dream with local people participation. Local people will get livelihood, which is what they are looking at. They just want something to live. They don't mind their wildlife life staying with them. They are worried because their livelihood is being lost. And this way, with such schemes, their livelihood can be preserved. They would love to have nature around them. They themselves will preserve the elephant because that elephant is giving them more money for their coffee. That's what is happening. Now, the same thing is with tigers. You know, because of Project Tiger, we have lots of forests which are preserved today. And we have wildlife which is preserved because the tiger is preserved. Now, the green spots here are the major tiger reserves in India. Again, the tiger is a very nomadic cat tries to move. It has got huge land. 13 square kilometers is what a tiger requires to move around. And you can imagine with 50 tigers, it's a huge, huge amount of land. Now, if this kind of uh, uh, fragmentation is happening in the forest, the tigers cannot move. So what we need is again, tiger corridors. So for example, here is a beautiful example of Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra taken together. Now, this is the Tadoba Nagzira uh, corridor where they are planning to connect Tadoba with Nagzira, Nagzira with Penge, Penge with uh, Satpura, Satpura with Melkart, and then again Penge with Kana. Now, you can imagine how far the tiger can move all along, and they, why should they come into the human settlements? Today, tigers are known to walk kilometers and kilometers through cities and small towns and go to the next forest. You cannot stop them because they, it is their land. We have gone into their forest. So we need to give them what is rightfully belonging to them. And in that, the forest will get healthy, it gets sustained. And along with forest, all other natural resources, the rivers, the streams, everything will get protected. And we would have a better biodiversity conservation possible by these simple measures. The thing is, People have to demand it. People like you and me has to support it. And then only government will take serious cognizance of this and put money into this rather than put money into some other development projects which are implemented with absolutely no ecological relevance. Now there are projects abroad, like this an example in Africa, where they have actually brought together huge amount of disciplines like there are scientists, farmers, village leaders, politicians, business people, they all came together and protected the elephant corridor in Botswana. Now this, there is a beautiful uh, video available on this project, you all can check it on the YouTube. They, how people are themselves taking care of the entire land. There is no forest department, all is done by the villagers because they realize that if I can take care of these elephants, entire wildlife, I'm getting more money, tourists are coming, my product is being sold, I can live very nicely with my small farms and I can live more happily by go to cities. And this is what is happening in many of these wildlife reserves in South Africa.
we can do the same models in India too. And there is a good example. Now here, this is an elephant corridor which they were planning to make where they are trying to link uh, the Rivak uh, National Park with the Suju, Siju National Park. These two national parks are to be linked. And there is also a plan to link up all these things, all these small, small green patches of forest. These red arrows are the corridors they are planning. Now, especially I'm talking about Rivak and Siju. Here, the tribals, the local people, voluntarily gave their houses. They left their homes. They went and settled in new places which was given by the government. NGOs and the local people, they worked together. They decided, okay, we give this land back to the elephants and we will go out of that forest and we will live. We will manage that corridors. And they have given us 1,250 hectares of community land they gave to the elephants for building this elephant corridor. Building means nothing. You just have to just leave it. The forest will take over and elephants will move. Only thing is there should not be any human beings in that. That's all. You don't have to do anything much in that corridor. Maybe put up some fences on some parts where cattle should not get it. Now what they did was they purchased the land. The government purchased the land. Voluntarily people reallocated. People are actually working as watchmen and sentries to see that the elephants are not disturbed. And the local people are getting job. And then with local participation, they did lots of eco-development work in those places by which they could do organic farming, cultivation, products of this could be sold and all of them got livelihood. Now this is a win-win situation for wildlife and human. This is what is a very good pro-ecology based development. This is what we need in every aspect of our life. Another aspect of our development is that we encroach into forest and make life miserable to all those wild animals. I mean, they don't understand what is the road meant to be. They just want to cross from one side to the other and they cross on the road and we get lots of deaths of wildlife, not only roads, railways, huge pipelines of oil and petrol, kerosene, water. All these are also so huge that the wildlife cannot cross over it. Even an elephant is unable to cross over the pipeline and that it divides the forest into two parts and the animals don't understand this partition. Same is with power lines. Elephants get electrocuted because the power lines sometimes fall on them and they die. And the forest is divided. Now this fragmentation of forest is to be avoided. This all can be done because science is there today to solve problems. I'll give you an example. Now here is an example of how a road which was passing through a national park, got bridges across so the animals can still pass over without crossing the road. And there are animals which are happily using it. Nothing is happening. No traffic accidents. The animals are safe. These are small culverts made for small animals to cross like tortoises, snakes, small cats, so that they can cross the road without coming on top. And animals tend to use this once they get used to it, which is just a short time, within a month to three months, they get used to all these kind of things. Another thing is, many of us have seen that there are culverts made in the streams, small rivers, and the road passes over it, you get culverts like this. But how is a culvert designed? They look at how much water flows in the monsoon, and then you make a design, and you make a pipe, and that is put across, and the road goes over it. That's the end of it. What happens is, when the water is flowing in large amounts, it is coming through a small narrow pipe, so the pressure increases so much that the fish and other small animals cannot go across. There are a lot of fish which migrate across the water flow and go upstream. Now this is a big environmental loss. Many of these culverts have waterfalls. Because of these waterfalls, small fishes are not able to go to the other side and they have to go. Now what is the solution? Change the culverts to this kind. Just make it plain. Make it to the level of the stream, the fishes can cross. Now these don't cost much, it just needs an ecological thinking. And we can help the government to think like this. Villages can think, make the government to think like this. So these are the ones which will lead us to more eco-friendly development.
here is an example is india not able to do it yes we are doing it this is a national highway 44 passing through the paint national park 37 kilometers of four lanes of highway passing through the national park with almost 9 to 12 underpasses and in fact uh, you know camera traps were kept on the underpasses and they saw that tigers are able to use tigers deer so many animals are using this underpass and this is on elevated road so there is no problem the traffic is going the animals are moving below it this can be done another good thing about this particular uh, construction is that with the modern technology the pre fabricated spans the bridges are built elsewhere and they are just brought to the site and you know assembled due to this there is minimum disturbance of construction in the forest so why not do this in so many places where we have problems of railway killing animals roads killing animals now here is a very simple thing that is done in a chinar wildlife sanctuary in south india you know the road is going so that the animals which live on top of the trees like squirrels and monkeys have to come down and cross the road to go to the other side so the forest department use a tribal knowledge ask them to make bridges hanging bridges from one tree to the other and you can imagine chinar national park has about wildlife sanctuary has about 19 of such canopy bridges and they are happily being used by animals including the endangered nine tail macaques we use these bridges to cross and many of the road kills have been reduced so very simple and giving employment to tribes local people they are the ones who are managing these bridges so if you think ecologically development can be eco friendly it's not that it is not it may cost you more but we should bear that cost that's my point look at what i am showing you now i am sure most of your grandparents and parents will tell me tell you all that yes we used to hear frogs croaking in monsoon now we don't hear where are the frogs gone we have destroyed all our ponds in the city made concreteized roads concreteized maidans so there are no ponds so the frogs are not there we have lost our garden lizard which is an important controller of insect so also the frog and we blame the municipality for dengue and malaria we have to be blamed because we have killed all these small forests there are no hedges we have even in the gardens have no hedges these are all fences or it is all concreteized walls so where will these lizards live so we are killing our own neighborhoods by our own way of changing our lifestyle considering it more development friendly and not eco friendly so what is sustainable development it is to consider the planet as a whole the people and of course the growth of both people and planet how can it be possible we need economic growth we need environmental protection we need social progress so if all these three can be addressed in one developmental project then we can call it as sustainable development because it gives economic wealth social equity which we talk so much and environmental health all these things can be easily achieved if the development programs are made more sustainable and what we need is conservation development leading to sustainability where we need to look at the natural resource we need to look at the social issues we need to look at the government participation we need to look at the political issues we need to look at the information gathering monitoring so that the project is considered uh, continuously reviewed and uh, readjusted and then we will have an economic growth so economics should come after all these things are sustained so it will definitely come economics need not be considered it will be part of that growth so what i am asking you is to make a small change in your lifestyle i call it conservation lifestyle what is it just reduce your self burden on nature i am myself a polluter i am speaking to you i am also a polluter and i realize it <clears throat> because i have realized it i have made changes in my lifestyle so that at least my burden on this nature is comparatively less than many of you this is what i expect you all to do be very sensitive to proactive environmental problems when people are talking about some environmental issues 
don't just stop them by saying that they are anti developed think of it there definitely there could be an angle i'm giving you a simple example we fought for the navaseva link to be shifted because it was going through the flamingo sanctuary and the government said nothing doing it will cost us more finally they relented they spent around 400 crores more but they changed the navaseva link and today the flamingo sanctuary is safe so if you can put little more money we can even save the ari forest if we shift the local shed of the monorail to somewhere else spend little more money same nature because that is more sustainable to future rather than saving your economy today with some short term non ecologically proactive uh, pro, uh, promotional things this is most important so what we should do we should develop sensitivity be aware of environmental impacts try to understand the impact remove that not in my backyard attitude remember a volcanic eruption in indonesia caused changes in our monsoon so gone are the days that we cannot think what is happening in other country may not affect us if it is nature it will have it will have effect globally so you need to change people say oh nobody is doing it why should i do it yes even if you do it it makes a difference at least try to compromise i am not saying that you change completely change a small amount reduce the relevant, uh, use of electricity in your house or reduce the wastage of electricity i should say wastage of electricity wastage of water wastage of food it's a big thing towards biodiversity conservation do it in your lifestyle i that's a big thing that you are all doing imagine everybody does it today we will have a real protection of our food resources i want all of you to make a definite attempt refuse to use those things which cannot be recycled but if you have to use them use it in limited amount and if you can use it please reuse them and if you cannot reuse them at least try to recycle it give it off so that it will be recycled in some manner this is what our bombay is today we are so proud about it though it is just a recent phenomenon why not keep it like that it's we who can do it you need to participate and learn that if we are with nature our development will be eco friendly and that will be more sustainable so what we develop today should also sustain our future generation think thus i hope you will all think again about your lifestyle and make it less burdensome to mother nature thank you have a nice day thank you sir yes thank you thanks a lot sir we will now move on to our question answer session there are a few questions which uh, people have asked so i'll just uh, say antara madam has asked sir aren't large scale projects passed uh, after through environmental impact assessments i wonder i uh, i always wonder how such projects get approved oh uh, you have touched a very sensitive issue <laughs> <coughs> in fact uh, uh, our current environment minister has passed several projects during the covid lockdown in fact we as environmentalists have been writing letters to them uh, yes there is a requirement of environmental impact assessment uh, but many times an environmental impact assessment is done not by a third party finally all these organizations are somewhere under the control of the government so the impact assessment is not very very impartial i should say now as i told you even for this uh, ceiling there were lots of reports environmental impact assessment even neeri which is a government agency which Uh, told about the problems they also had a negative report but still government went ahead so environmental impact assessment is yes you can challenge it in the court and so on but that's a long drawn bit basically people need should not ask for such kind of development projects that's the first thing okay. uh the next question is from rujita madam she asks sir what is what are the possible repercussions of the deforestation ra that was done to construct the met metro shed 
Okay. Uh, now there are two very, two different aspects to this. Let me be very frank. I've seen this forest myself. I've been going to that place since almost 1980. Uh, that RA forest that we are talking about is actually not a natural forest, but it's a green lung because it has been surviving there for so many years. In fact, the trees are so tall that it almost looks like a forest. Now the question is, do you want to remove this green lung in a city like Mumbai where we are trying to save our green uh, areas because we have very less left? And if there is an alternative place available, even if it costs little more, I mean in terms of crores for a government it is not much because it is a long drawn project. Why not spend that extra amount and shift it? That's the question we are all asking. Yes, correct. Okay, the next question is from Janvi. She asks, Sir, what about the urban wild space conservation where these urban species biodiversity is overlooked at times? Yeah, uh, in fact, uh, world over, especially in Europe and USA, uh, there are different projects now wherein uh, urban population is made sensitive about the urban wildlife. So, you know, uh, people are encouraged to uh, plant trees in their backyard. Uh, they are asked to change hedges, uh, put flowers, and they are given which species of plants to be put up so that the birds would come, butterflies would come. Now, we need to also look at these things. I mean, unfortunately, uh, our Mumbai city has very less of native trees. And uh, the other problem is our native trees are very stubborn. They don't grow very fast. Mm -hmm. So, growing them in nurseries is very difficult. You can go and get Subabul so easily, but you get a mango sapling or a tamarind sapling which you can put up in your garden is very difficult. So. In this situation, the forest department and nursery departments have to come in and they need to change the plants they use for uh, local plantation. Once you bring the local plants, you will find the local wildlife will come back. That's the major problem. Okay. So one last question which I have. So how can we approach government to stop or make certain changes in the projects which we feel are harmful to the environment which is the best possible way or route to do that most of these projects uh, when they are commissioned you know there is a mandatory requirement of the government of india constitution that they should have a public hearing and many times these public hearings are held and unfortunately many of us don't reach them now, even for the ceiling, uh, we had uh, with us the fishermen from Mahim. Uh, you know, Mahim has a fishermen colony, about 50 families of 50 to 100 families are there. They all came for the, uh, you know, public hearing to say their word. And that is how our petition got accepted in the Supreme Court. So, one of the ways that you all can raise your voice is to go for this public hearing and listen and put up uh, the technical viewpoints and additionally there are some environmental NGOs who are actually looking at these projects from a different angle. Of course there are some political uh, angles there, if you can bypass those angles, environmental angles should be always supported. So people's voices should be raised, that's the most important. Yes. Uh, there is one last question that we can take since there is a time crunch. Uh, Nirmal uh, has written a big question. I will just read it out. Sir, can't we just request the policies to save endemic ones instead of cultivating invasive ones? In BMC gardens, we can observe lantana and many more people focus on abundant species like investing on kabutarkhana, feeding strays which are changing behavior of leopards and kites. We are trying investing but not in right manner like to say for example we have bias dying, sparrows disappearing gradually. So what can we do about it? Urban wildlife, urban biodiversity is a major issue. Uh, needs to be tackled at local ward level. And as you rightly mentioned, it is the decision makers who have to put in their effort. 
for that to happen the local people also need to be um, you know enlightened they should be knowledgeable of what it means and then they should demand you know we uh, i i don't want to say this but in borivali national park uh, during my days in the early 90s they they had a plantation drive and they put gulmohar all along mm. and i was one of the person who volunteered in a group and we uprooted all those trees <laughs> i mean this was a protest that we did and then we went to the forest department and conservator and said why are you planting gulmohar in borivali national park yes. and you could have planted some native trees so now of course forest department has changed they have a nursery which gives endemic trees there are uh, municipal nursery which has started producing uh, endemic trees so not that they have changed but the program has to spread and more widely that has not happened correct correct so we have come towards the uh, end of the session sir i would like to uh, give a vote of thanks of course a vote of thanks um I would like to thank first of all our principal, Dr. Anushri Lokur, madam, our vice principals, deans, and management committees for giving us this opportunity. I would like to thank our speaker, Dr. Sasi Kumar Menon. It was indeed an illuminating session, sir, where many of our unanswered questions were definitely answered. You made us think about certain uh, actions we do unconsciously, which. Uh, we ignore with regards to nature and it is really a time that we think what we are doing and rather than thinking what others are doing that is what i i i will take back that not my backyard as is not supposed to be now the notion which we can carry forward so thank you for such eye opening session sir i uh, really value that you have taken your time especially when we know your tight schedule even during this period of lockdown so thank you i would like to thank our entire team of biology of uh, department of zoology uh, our hod dr jessi payas ma'am um, dr vaishali kusate ma'am dr durga ma'am dr Sh- shakil momin and dr swati uh, miss anjali mari for their unwavering support I would honestly thank Mr. Abhijit Gore for his guidance and technical support for the smooth conduct of this webinar. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all the participants for their whole hearted support, without which this would not have been a successful event. So I thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Just before thank leaving. Thank you, Arjun. Yes. Just before leaving. Thank you for the yeah. Yes. Sorry, sir. I'm interrupting you. Uh, no, no problem. Yeah. Before we leave, just one small request to the participants. I would send you a feedback form link, which uh, I will send it to you on your registered email ID. So it would be really great if you can fill it up and send it to us, so that your valuable opinion will be taken into consideration when we do our other webinars. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. So thank we you. Thank you, all of you. Let's Thanks. Conclude the session. Thank you.